the bones in your joints don't touch. Well, they can, but usually bad things happen. Good morning. Happy Friday. I have NeuroCoffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, it's Friday. Looking forward to a solid weekend, but we got to dig into this Q&A. It's going to be a deep one. There's there's multiple parts here that we got to try to cover in a very short period of time. Um, kind of a perfect storm of questions. Yesterday we had the Coffee and Coaches Conference call at 6 a.m. on Thursday. Um, hope you join us next time. Um, where uh, the, the question was, why don't bones touch? We talked about one mechanism. And then Johnny came through the, the askbillhartman at gmail.com with a question that is along the same lines and will allow us to dig a little bit deeper into the detail. And so Johnny says, hey, Bill. Hey, Johnny. Since bones don't actually touch, I'm curious about an explanation by your model as to why we get things like osteoarthritis. Also, why is it more common in the medial compartment of the knee rather than the lateral? Excellent question, Johnny. And so let's dig into this. Now, let me let me preface this. I can't cover everything possible in regards to your arthritic situation, but we're gonna cover a lot of the mechanical aspects that I think are in play and are important to me in regard to how I perceive these things through my model. First things first, Johnny, we're gonna invert your problem a little bit. We're gonna say, well, why is it bad if bones touch? So so the bones touching thing um, probably comes from the using dead guy anatomy as a model. So, so dead guys actually do have levers. And so to have a lever, you have to have a fulcrum. And so the bones touch on dead guys because they're dry. And so they look like levers. And so then in school, they teach you that, oh, your joints move just like levers. The reality is in a living, breathing human, and the fact that we're full of water and we've got snow veil fluid in our joints, we don't have fulcrums. If we had a fulcrum, there would be a lot of pressure and heat that would be released every time we moved and we would destroy our joints in no time. And so we don't want fulcrums um, in our joints. In fact, if you do have a fulcrum in your joint, you're probably talking to the orthopedic surgeon right now. So now what we have to understand is that we have to have mechanisms that keep these bones from touching. So let's break these down. Now, let's start with structure. So your 99% water, 1% stuff, your 1% stuff is almost all the same and it's all viscoelastic tissue. And so I have a representation of viscoelastic tissues in my silly putty. And so this is viscoelastic, so it's gonna behave very similarly. And so viscoelastic tissue will behave differently depending on the forces that are applied. So if I stretch this gently, I get this nice elongation of, of my silly putty, but if I pull it really hard and fast, it snaps off clean. So what that means is, is the tissue behavior changes based on the forces that are applied. And so when I apply a high rate of force, I get very, very stiff viscoelastic tissue. So this is the overcoming action that I always talk about when we're talking about concentric overcoming or eccentric overcoming behaviors. So I have an increased stiffness of tissue. So if I had an orientation of, of fibers as such that if I loaded them at, at, a, at a higher rate, I can make them really, really stiff. And so we actually have that. So when we look at the fascia that surrounds everything, so we talk about the, the periosteum, we talk about the, the fascia that surrounds all of the ligamentous structure and all the structures around the knee. So the knee is very busy when you look at it from a connective tissue standpoint. And so what happens is when we load that, that joint, those viscoelastic tissues behave very, very similar to my silly putty. They get very, very stiff and they create this rigidity around the knee and that actually pushes the bones apart. So now we have a mechanical uh, protective mechanism that helps us keep those, those bones apart. So that's very, very useful. Now, it's a little counterintuitive too, by the way, when you think about it, it's like you think of these are like tension elements and stretchy stuff, they become very, very stiff. So keep that in mind. Now. Let's go to inside the knee joint. So the, the knee is filled with water, basically. It's synovial fluid, so it's water with some protein stuff that floats around. Well, water is this really, really unique substance um, that, that is cooler than you can imagine. And so water behaves differently, just like our viscoelastic tissues behave differently under different forces, water behaves differently depending on what substance it's next to. And so we have hyaline cartilage that lines the, uh, the, the joint, um, if we talk about the knee, so at the end of the femur, we have hyaline cartilage. On the tibia, we have hyaline cartilage. And so when the water's right next to it, it promotes the separation of the water into a positively and negatively charged water. So the negative charged water is right along the hyaline cartilage on both sides. And then the positively charged water's going right through the middle of the knee. 
So, if you took the north end of, of, of two magnets and try to push them together, you could feel the repulsion between, between the two magnets. So this positively charged water is constantly trying to push its positive charges apart. And so now we've got this electromagnetic force that is now pushing the knee apart. So now we have a, an electromagnetic effect to create uh, this, this separation. And so there's a cool study from 1980 from Teriyama, it's Japanese. Um, and they took fresh cadaver knees with intact synovial joints and they applied downward pressure through the joint, about 220 pounds into the knee joint and they compressed and then it hit sort of like a, like a maximum uh, position, but the bones didn't touch. So they got really, really close together, but they did not touch. And so right away, even even in, in a, a, a joint that's not living, but it's intact, and, and um, we have all the structures available to us, it still behaves similarly. So it keeps the, the bones apart. So again, very, very strong electromagnetic effect. How do we know? Well, in the same study, they took a hip joint that, that had uh, arthritis. So, so on the weight-bearing surface, there was no cartilage. They did the same compressive uh, test and they got the subchondral bones to touch because there was no cartilage in the way to create this electromagnetic effect and keep the, keep the joints apart. So kind of a big deal. Now, synovial fluid has little protein things that are floating around. Proteins are negatively charged and they would, they would attract positive charges just like two magnets. So you take the north end of one magnet, the south end, and they snap right together. And so, so we have these proteins that are surrounded by positive charge. We get more positive charges. And so now the synovial fluid itself helps us create that, that middle uh, positively charged area that keeps the, the joints apart. <clears throat> So if, for those of you that have had arthritic uh, changes and, and, and some, some wonkiness in your knees, if you will, that have had the Synvisc injections, what they're doing is they're injecting you with water that has protein in it and it helps restore some of that mechanism, which is why you might feel better for a little while until, until the effect is no longer um, intact. So we have structure, we have mechanics, we have electromagnetic forces that keep the bones apart. So if they keep the bones apart, how on earth do we get arthritic changes? So now we gotta look at the synovial joint a little bit closer. So when we look at the structure of the synovial joint, on either end, as long as we maintain our hyaline cartilage intact, it appears that we can keep our, our, our bones apart. So we have to look at how, what affects that hyaline cartilage. And we say, oh, pressure, tension, blah, 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 blah. But the reality is, is hyaline cartilage gets its nutrition from the bony side. So you'll see the little little arteries that I drew on my picture here. And that, that blood supply is what gives the nutrition to the cartilage, so it diffuses um, from from the uh, the bloodstream towards the hyaline cartilage on the bony side. Well, if I put enough pressure and tension on those bones, those trabecula will compress. If the trabecula at the ends of the bone compress enough, I restrict the blood flow to the to the ends of the joint. Now, these trabecula can also fracture. So, you know, you played 15 years in the NBA, you're probably going to get some 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 fracturing of those trabecula. They're kind of like shock absorbers. If you ever driven on the uh, on the interstate, and you see the the trash barrels um, right right bef below the 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 uh, abutment of the overpass, and what those are is they're, they're trash barrels filled with water. So if you drive off the road and you hit them, it'll slow you down so you don't slam right into the bridge. Trabecula kind of the same way. They're kind of like shock absorbers, so they're filled with with space and water. And so when you land, they compress, but they can fracture over time, and then you compress, and then the subchondral bone actually gets denser. And so you'll see this in arthritic research. Well, they'll, they'll see the the precipitating uh, uh, changes of the. Uh, subchondral bone gets denser and denser and denser. Well, that's gonna reduce our blood flow to the, to the cartilage. The cartilage will slowly wear away and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So now we're losing our electromagnetic effect. So now we can't keep the joint farther and farther apart. And so now we do get compressive strategies um, that will actually become destructive. And so again, on that end, that's pretty much how I see a lot of these arthritic changes occurring because it's a pressure related phenomenon. It's a blood flow re related phenomenon. It's a nutrition to the cartilage. By the way, discs do the same thing. Okay, don't tell anybody. Now, how do we get medial compartment versus lateral compartment? So now we gotta think about our propulsive strategies. So our propulsive strategies are what we apply into the ground. And so propulsion 
in, in and of itself is biased towards internal rotation. So we have to apply pressure to the ground. So remember, when, when we evolved, we were, we were externally rotated, we were swimmers, we came up on land, we had to learn how to internally rotate and press into the ground. And so Johnny, when we talk about the internal rotation, I got to internally rotate my femur, right? Because I got to drive down into the ground through internal rotation. So uh, more often than not, I'm going to be applying a little bit more force towards that medial compartment as I internally rotate the femur to push into the ground. And so if we talk about the pressure mechanism that we just talked about in regard to the, the arthritis, that's why we would probably see the bias towards more medial compartment problems than lateral compartment problems because we, we're applying forces into the ground. We have to just because of gravity. Okay, so I'm gonna breathe for a second. That's a lot to cover. Hope you guys have some questions. I'd be happy to answer those to the best of my ability, but that's kind of what we're talking about, bones not touching and, and how we develop arthritis in a nutshell. I hope it was useful for you. Have a great weekend and I will see you next week.